Hi, everybody, and uh, good evening. You're, you're all very welcome. I'm um, John Barry, and I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action to this uh, Economic and Social Research Council uh, Social Science Festival, organised by my colleague, Theresa Hill, who I'd like to acknowledge. And before I forget, can we give Theresa a round of applause? for bringing this together. Uh, thanks for coming out on a bit of a miserable wet night to talk about a miserable wet topic, let's be honest. Um, the title of tonight's discussion is something that's on all of our minds, you know, just chatting beforehand that um, we shouldn't be calling it perhaps trees a cost of living crisis, it's a cost of profiteering crisis. We can't blame everything on the war in Ukraine. Um, Particularly in a week in which the seven largest fossil fuel companies in the world made 180 billion pounds in pure profit. One BP made seven billion uh, pounds alone. And yet we have not a stone's throw away from where we are. People having to face the awful situation of heat or eat. Um, as many of you know, my area <coughs> is green politics and climate change and so on. But I am praying for a really, really warm winter um, because the impact on our most vulnerable community who do often have to be often women. You know, it, it's it, it, the, the burdens of the cost of these crises, whether it's war, whether it's climate change itself, or indeed the cost of profiteering crisis uh, is often um, women. So tonight we, we've come together in a way to um, focus on the cost of profiteering, cost of living crisis, call it what you will, which is now, in my view, a social catastrophe. A social catastrophe. You know, a piece of research that colleagues at the University of York did um, back in August, <clears throat> where they were calcul calculating across the four devolved regions of the UK about the impacts of the energy increases. And this was factoring in the, um, you know, the, the money the government was giving, which, of course, we haven't got you here yet, thanks, DUP. Uh, in terms of the, the, that much needed uh, money. Doc dare pay, Mr. Heaton Harris. Why is everybody in the, I mean, that's a separate, it's a different uh, talk <laughs> I, can, I can give. But this, this piece of research from York um, calculated that it's a, an amazing figure, it's horrible. 76% of households in Northern Ireland will be in fuel poverty come January. That means they're spending 10% or more of their income just to stay warm. Now, to me, that's not a cost of living or a cost of profit. That is a social emergency. That is akin to the pandemic. And there is an issue that we can talk about tonight in terms of the role of the state. How come the state could move with such speed and determination, furlough workers, you know, buy PPE, uh, often from dodgy sources linked to the Tory party. Sorry, I keep straying into uh, the politics. But the state did act in the context of that emergency. And yet we're not seeing the same movement by, by the state when it comes to the cost of living crisis. What we have seen, and this brings us then to the topic of tonight's discussion, is something that we all, all, often see whenever there's a crisis. I remember when we had the Syrian refugee crisis. Remember that? People tend to forget about it. Is that probably with the exception of Germany and Mama Merkel, all praise Mama Merkel. We, we sadly miss her now, her guidance. But with the exception of Germany, which took in a million Syrian refugees, uh, the UK shamefully took in a couple of thousand. But I remember even here in Belfast, the generosity of ordinary people, and there was collections over in the, the Students' Union, and people getting vans together, and there was people-to-people -people solidarity of sending uh, you know, medicines, of clothes, of toys, to those refugees that were landing in Lesbos and the southern parts of, of Greece. And we're seeing something similar now in the context of the cost of living crisis. You know, whether it's, you know, Pauline from Grow, who's going to speak uh, in a moment, or Louise in the larder, uh, from the larder in East Belfast, of people coming together um, to respond to the needs of others. It's a bit like, if you ever read the wonderful um, novel by John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath, he has a very good line in it. He says, if you're ever down and out, go to the poor because the poor will look after you. Not the rich, not the affluent, not the privileged. And we're seeing that already, that it is the generosity of people. And though I have issues with the whole food bank idea in the sense that our society shouldn't need food banks. 
Food should be a right, not a, a, a charity, and so on. I mean, that's one thing in terms of the way our food system is broken. But at the very least, we cannot uh, c- uh, condemn anyone who is meeting the immediate needs of, of people, um, whether it's through food banks or even now, and I know this is a controversial issue amongst some anti-poverty activists, of warm banks, where we've seen across England, you know, Bristol, I think, was the first place where as a way of you know, giving people some warmth that they don't have to spend the money on, council, you know, offices, you know, community halls being open so people can come in and stay warm. You know, I was reminded of this when I was talking to my, my brother's a, a, a bus man in Dublin, and he was saying that him and his colleagues have already been briefed by their managers to expect loads of old age pensioners to be on the buses in Dublin. Not because they're going anywhere, but just that they can stay warm and they're bringing on, you know, flasks and books. I mean, to me, this is a sign of a broken society where we even have to do that in the context that we have loads of wealth. That's the issue. That's why I'm a socialist. It's not as if we don't have the wealth or the money. The problem is it's all out where I live in North Down or here in parts of South Belfast. And I do think that's a bigger issue which, you know, mouthy lefties like me like to go on about. And there is an issue here that when we talk in these general terms and so on, yes, they're, they're correct about the big political issue. It doesn't butter any parsnips. It's not going to keep anyone warm, condemning the evils of capitalism and so on. And it's that gentle, if you like, dance or dialogue between, yes, looking at the structural causes. What's the real root causes of poverty, of inequality and so on? And to deal with those, but that, that's a longer term project. And at the same time, what are we going to do to meet the real needs of people in the here and now? So for me, it's not an either or, it's both and. We need to meet the needs of people right here and now. Or in the words of Arch, you know, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, he said, yes, we should definitely pull people out of the water who are drowning. But after a while, we've got to say, hold on, what's, what's happening? What's happening upstream that's causing them to fall into the water in the first place? So that's the issue. Why we have to deal with the root causes... And in case you're wondering, the root causes of capitalism, by the way, or the structure of our, our economy. Yes, that's a, but that's a much longer term project. And really, for a lot of people who are hungry and starving now, condemning the evils of capitalism is a piece of privileged, woke kind of um, you know, um, way of talking. So while I'm giving, just giving you the piece of privileged, woke, condemning the evils of capitalism, I am also delighted that we're going to also focus on what is happening in the here and now in terms of how people's needs can be met. So we're going to have the two interventions from Pauline and Louise, and then we're going to hand it over to yourselves for a discussion. So can you give a big warm welcome for Pauline? Hello. (laughs) Uh, We have some of our volunteers here. This is Roshona and Riona and Reshma and Katie. Um, from Grow. So I work for uh, Grow Community, Gar- uh, Community Gardens. <coughs> and um, how do I get this on, Alan? <laughs> uh, do you recognise that person? This is Roshona here uh, during the summer. So I work for Grow. Um, we've been going for uh, 2008 and um, we are located in the Waterworks Park in North Belfast. And we are within the, the park itself, so we're, the land we're on belongs to council and they lease it to us year on year and that's really all we have to do with them, really. They don't really come near us at all and we quite like it like that. <laughs> Is this going to the council afterwards? Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, they're actually quite good and they leave us alone and we just get on with stuff. And um, it's kind of gone from strength to strength, really. It's on a peace line between Westland Gardens and Westland Estate. And it was a piece of really derelict land. I think there was a horse grazing on it before. And uh, maybe like the remains of, of uh, missiles and, and different things. And then a local woman called Siobhan approached the council and asked if, uh, if, if the community could have that piece of land. And it's quite small. We do a lot for like such a small little space. We have about 70, 80, maybe sometimes 100 people coming through each week. And uh, we're a registered charity now. And uh, we have three staff. So there's myself two days a week. We're all two days a week. 
and we're funded by the lottery and we hope to get lottery funding again but you know there's that constant kind of battle of of getting uh, funded but the heart of the organization is the volunteers so we've about well about maybe 40 volunteers core volunteers 25 about really active volunteers and then over a hundred kind of regular participants and we're very much led by the people who are involved and um and we're all about community we started out as a growing project but it's it's grown you know it's gone beyond that now and we've kind of branched out into all sorts of things which i'll talk to you about and we're just kind of dipping our toe in the water with kind of anything that is about connecting with the with nature with the green spaces around us and and social justice as well we're all about um you know looking at the the root causes of what has us the way we are what has this community the way it is and how are people struggling and what can we do on a on a day-to-day -day, very practical level and like in relation to climate breakdown it's practical ways for people to engage to learn skills to then and we don't wish to control that we just want to be somewhere people can come and learn and get inspired and then go off and and do other things wherever they are and that's what happens like for example in our community gardens people come there's always a gardener there and then they take what they learn and they go off and maybe get an allotment in Ballysillen or start an alleyway garden where they live or, or whatever, start some kind of, uh, start a fire in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. And um, so we really see ourselves as a springboard for action. And, uh, and that's really kind of in the last few years what we've, we've been much more outward looking uh, up until about maybe five or six years ago it was all about the groups that were meeting and it was kind of you know it was growing and cups of tea and meeting and that's important too but we've realized that actually we need to be looking outward and thinking about the bigger issues that are happening around us and really engaging with those and finding practical ways for people to engage um, so that's Roshona. Roshona, this is your garden, isn't that? And this is Riona. <laughs> a lot of people in North Belfast don't have gardens and um, access to green spaces. So people who use the space, we really want them to have an ownership of it. And I think that does happen. Um, our model is, again, rooted in social justice in the community. And it's, a connecting, it's connecting with each other. It's connecting with the with the green spaces around us and nature, and it's kind of I mean if it doesn't sound too grand, it's you connect with yourself too because it's a bit of an oasis. People who walk by the garden comment on, you know, that it makes them happy because it's such a well kept, loved space, you know, and um, and it's a safe space. So it's within the bounds of the waterworks, but it it's a separate space, and you can close the gate, and we can do whatever we like in there. And so people come and they feel safe and uh, and that's really important, especially for people who are new to the area and don't know or maybe um, just finding out how things work in Belfast, you know. So <clears throat> the, the kind of model that we use is there's in, in all of the gardening groups, uh, we have a community gardener there and their job is is not to be a horticultural expert, although Craig and Claire are really knowledgeable. But it's, it's as much about the groups and creating the, a kind of a welcoming environment where everybody feels like they've something to contribute because they do and that we draw that out of them, you know. And uh, so then in each group, you'd have a core of maybe four or five very active people, very active participants who maybe will open up or close up or uh, support people and... And, and then you'll have participants who just want to come because it's a good place for them to be, for their mental health, for isolation, all sorts of reasons. So people participate at whatever level they want to and there's absolutely no pressure to do anything. Uh, some people are like champion weeders sometimes. People love making the tea. Sometimes it's just about, the, it's the person who just mulls around and chats to people and that's really important too. Um, and yeah, and it's all about sharing skills. This is Lemia from our, our Wednesday group as well. Um, so how we do that then is um, we have four groups at the Waterworks. We also work out of a garden on the Limestone Road um, in Camberwell Court. It's a Newington Housing Association. Uh, we support Guardian and Fubble, which I'll tell you about later. That's uh, GAP for short. It's in White Rock and it has a whole story, which is very interesting. 
and we support Momo, which is part of Fort Spring Intercommunity on the Springfield Road as well. And in our next phase, we're hoping to also, well, because we're bursting at the seams, really, in our waterworks garden, and there's so much more we want to do. So we're kind of on the lookout, in case anybody's interested in <laughs> collaborating, um, especially in North and West Belfast area. And there's a lot of skill shares sharing happens. Um, the community gardener mentors is, is like a mentor to people, and then they learn. Um, <laughs> lots of high heels up and down the corridor. Can you hear me all right? Is this, yeah. Um, and then we organize training as well. So we bring in practical stuff like first aid and food hygiene and that are um, thrive, you know, therapeutic horticulture, just really whatever anyone's interested in. Um, <clears throat> and things are winding down now for the winter months. So there's a whole change of rhythm. The gardening groups kind of stop meeting weekly and then we run training or we just do um, kind of more irregular and, and just, well, at the moment we're organizing like um, a foraging course and the women in the Wednesday group are interested in some of the plants that we grew through the, throughout the summer, um, like lavender, chamomile, tarragon, calendula, all sorts and how to make cosmetics out of those and medicinal products as well. So we have a short program, for example, happening with that group between now and February. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing we'll do over the winter. Uh, so this is kind of repetitive, really, but um, we are really about building connection. You know, that's a lot of what we're doing. And uh, so we're kind of looking outwards but looking inwards in the groups the groups are very safe because they they all know people get to know each other and we kind of open them in march and keep them going till october and then open them again the next march um so people develop really strong relationships um and more and more we're collaborating with other organizations now and linking in with the growing network like bridge and caroline here um across belfast because there's through COVID, I mean, there was just a whole big explosion, really, with COVID, of interest in this stuff. And um, like in West, that's when we started working in West Belfast, actually, because there was a derelict garden in White Rock, uh, which people had kind of gone to wreck and ruin a bit. And um, I was working for PPR, which is a human rights organization at the time, and they were kind of looking over their shoulder, going, oh, I like what you're doing over there at Grow. We'd like a bit of that, and our campaigners have nowhere to meet. You know, we've nowhere for our activists to hatch plans. So, and they knew of this place in White Rock. So they got, we got the keys. We basically just got the keys, moved in. And that garden, I'll tell you more about it, but that's just, it's an amazing space, so exciting. And uh, you just never know what's going to happen there. It's open every Friday morning if you ever want to pop in 10 till 12. And you don't, you just never know who you're going to meet or what's going to be on the agenda. Um, so, these are just some examples of stuff we've done at the garden, like big gatherings pre-COVID, really. We had a singing group, we did Tai Chi, um, and then we have an, a local artist looking at um, this idea of a dreamer space, which is all about the spaces that we occupy and how do we really like, be um, kind of aware and, and bring people, especially children, into those spaces. And, um, <coughs> So this was kind of me just kind of going, what is it all that we do trying to prepare for this year and going, right, so we do food growing. We're about food justice, you know, that people learn how, where their food comes from and that supermarkets actually aren't the be all and end all. Like at the garden, you never get your week's shopping of vegetables, never. You might get two spuds, a tomato and a carrot, you know, and an onion or whatever. But it's not about that. It's about learning the skills, feeling like that you know what you're doing with, with seeds and, um, and knowing that there is another way of doing things and then that you go on and do something else. We're about the nature connection stuff. We do some forest school, dipping our toe in the water with some ecotherapy, like making links with people who are working in that way. I work as a therapist as well in another job and, you know, really just trying to there's a lot more interest in that now as well, and that's a growing field. So thinking about, can we support the development of that movement here? And access to green spaces, obviously, um, especially for people like in North Belfast, a lot of them, people don't have gardens. The connections with mental health are really obvious. And then the social isolation, 
And then more recently, thinking about la wider land justice issue, you know, issues and, and thinking about all of the derelict land in this city. It's such a rich city. There's so much land and so many derelict buildings and spaces. Like, who is that benefiting? It's not, you know, there's no reason why community, communities shouldn't have access to those spaces for, for growing in the first instance, at least. Uh, so like, we've been linking in with PPR around um, mapping spaces and hoping to really develop that down the line and linking in with uh, you know incredible edible you know Pam Warhurst across the water and she's working with um, some of her board on this right to cultivate piece of legislation in the UK and uh, so kind of watching that as well you know that people have a right if there's vacant land that they should have a right to cultivate on that land and then being a springboard for action um, and we've been linking in you know, so it's not just about growing, it's seeing the connections between everything and how, as John said, you know, <laughs> capitalism in its current form doesn't serve anybody. There are other ways of doing things and people, you can't imagine what you haven't experienced. So it's like, can we create kind of examples of what's possible? And we're working with PPR in that vein on a piece of public land in the west of the city. Um, about building a, a truly like a, a sustainable community there and um, and then how that connects in with climate justice food justice all of that stuff and then um, linking in with Anaka women's collective who Reshma is, is our link between um, Grow and Anaka women's collective but um, how they really went from strength to strength it's a group of women who are mainly newcomers to Belfast many of them have been through the asylum system are still in the asylum system and and they felt locked down more than anybody you know didn't have access to internet or devices and were really very disadvantaged but pooled their resources and did really amazing stuff really amazing stuff online you know and um such an inspiration and so we've linked in with anaka and that's um and reshma is our bridge between the two organizations collaborating with them to look at like mutual aid initiatives but starting really with we've had now for the last two seasons a group at the garden meet every wednesday and it's just so vibrant and it's just been so good for us at grow to have that you know it's just brought a whole new energy and we're very grateful for for that collaboration this is just a nice picture <laughs> This is a nice picture of all of the things that community gardens do and I, I found it on the internet and I just thought, you know, we'll just, but we do, we do all of this thing, these things, as do all, all community growing projects like Bridges and Carolines and around this city. There's some amazing, really amazing stuff happening around the environment, the social environment, about healthy eating, about access to healthy food, about learning about how to grow healthy food and decreasing our reliance on expensive supermarkets, um, wasteful supermarkets, dysfunctional food systems. Um, and then the connection, and then thinking about the mental health stuff, right? Because when Grow started, there was initially, it was thought it was going to be for, uh, it was going to be a mental health project, but very quickly people were very clear they didn't, didn't want to be stigmatizing themselves, go, you know, making it a mental health charity, but, I mean, every all of mental health, yeah, so like everybody needs to mind their mental health and there's no big mystery that we all need to be outdoors, we all need to be eating healthy food, we all need a roof over our head. If everybody had those things, we wouldn't have a mental health, you know, epidemic as we have at the minute. So digging a bit deeper and realising and, and naming it and being really explicit that this is about inequality, discrimination, it's about poverty, the violence of poverty and um and really naming that and and saying that this is w this is where we place ourselves as an organization is challenging this um we're not just about meeting and growing lettuce and having cups of tea actually although we do that too and th and some people that's how they want to engage and that's brilliant as well um I put this up because I kind of liked it. It's, you know, the take five that you see on the billboards and all, which is great. We all know what we need to be doing to be healthy and well. And if it was only that easy, you know, it would be fucking brilliant, wouldn't it? <laughs> if it was only, if we could all just keep learning, connect, take notice, be active and, and give. 
but it's really hard you know to do all the things that we know we should be doing and actually it's not all our responsibility you know it's down to those in power to give five as well you know to take notice of early warning signs this was an exact this is actually from the ppr mental health campaign one of their campaigners did this here and i i really liked it so i kept it um that it's this is not all about it's not down to the individual only you know you can be the most responsible human being and really want the best for your children and just really struggle with the basics day to day and not be able to give that so let's name that you know um and stop putting all the responsibility onto the people who have the least so some of the collaborations that i just wanted to kind of mention um first one is with ppr which is participation and practice of rights it's a human rights organization in belfast and um they're basically troublemakers really and uh, they uh, don't take any public funding so they're they're like an independent voice and they challenge they hold duty bears to account and i told you we kind of i was working with them part-time as well we connected in with them got the keys to guardian and fobble in white rock and um and it's just gone from strength to strength like we started out there this is our second season so first season we just went in, right? We were like, well, what are we going to do here, lads? Right, okay. The beds are all falling apart. You know, the place is in, it really needs quite a bit of work. But there was so much energy and enthusiasm from people who had never grown anything in their life. You know, what they didn't have in knowledge, they made up for in enthusiasm. And so Claire, who works with me, like she was converted. She was like, I want to really support this group. Like, so now, she uh, she's our coordinator and she's plenty of other things to be doing but she wouldn't miss a friday morning over at G at gap and she um is kind of the she's a, she's like the person who makes the plan of what to grow and keeps them right from week to week and then everything happens around that and people have just come out of the woodwork doing all sorts of amazing stuff and their confidence is growing and now they're flying and you know any friday morning head over there um, at the moment, they're working at, um, where is it? Oh, I mustn't have put it in, actually. It's a heat and eat thing. So last Friday, they baked baked potatoes in this earth oven here, which we built over the winter. That's it in its kind of half made form. But through the winter last year, we built that from clay from, from Black Mountain, basically somebody's back garden. And it just kept us busy all winter, like <laughs> even in the snow. It fell through, we had to rebuild it and everything. Um, but uh, it kept us going. And I'm um, sorry, this, this uh, statue up, somebody donated that to us. It's the iron, the iron, well, I forget what the iron woman I'm calling her, but it's iron will to survive, basically. And sometimes, Not no, 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 <laughs> not the iron lady, uh, sometimes, uh, she has a can of Red Bull in her hand in the morning. Her tin is either. So that's the extent of the vandalism. Um, Breakfast of champions. <laughs> that's the earth oven. I find myself stuck at the earth oven quite a lot uh, because uh, nobody else seems to want to make pizzas, but <laughs> they all want to eat them. <clears throat> and just to say, like linking into the PPR stuff, they're part of a wider land justice campaign that centres around a 26 acre site in West Belfast, which is publicly owned by the department with responsibility for housing. They're looking to give it to the council uh, to put a greenway through it. Greenways, amazing, fantastic greenways. All good, but much better use if there's housing on either side of them. So that's the basis of the campaign is that, yes, put a greenway, but also uh, this is the area of highest housing need in the state. We need housing in that area, but it's an interface between Shankill and Springfield Road. So there's a lot of agendas at play. A lot of people want the status quo to remain as it is. And, uh, and so nobody is talking about housing. Nobody is engaging. Lots of people are engaging. People with housing need are engaging in the campaign. And a lot of people are remaining very, very silent because politically it's, it's a hot potato. Um, so I just wanted to mention that and to say that part of what we did last year was to sort of go into that side and just start making a mark there. Um, we did a permaculture session on, we walked the land with Philip Allen and imagined what it might be like 
if you had a permaculture development on that site because permaculture isn't exclusive to North Down. <laughs> People in West Belfast are <laughs> also deserve to know about permaculture and um, and so we just went in and did that and started thinking about you know if if we just got this land tomorrow, what would you do here? You'd put a beautiful, sustainable community, financially sustainable, ecologically sustainable, socially sustainable, in terms of the well, the the two the two main communities in in that part of Belfast, and we uh, sowed <coughs> seeds in that derelict piece of land there, and it was a beautiful meadow during the summer. I don't have a picture of it all sprouted, unfortunately. Um, that, that there is a seed fiddle that a guy brought down to us um, and we went around and planted seeds and we're going to do a willow walk next, hopefully. Um, and this is just to let you know, there's a map started, takebackthecity.ie map, um, where we started, uh, I say we, not me, uh, PPR have started mapping derelict or vacant land in the city. And that campaign is still rolling on. And at the moment, there's a competition. 11 architects from all over the world have drawn up their vision of what that site could look like uh, with a bit of imagination. And that's the link to take you to the competition. Please go on and look at them. They're amazing and, and vote for your favorite one. Um, and this is all just building the campaign, imagining, you know, imagining what that could look like. Um, we also link in with Newington Housing Association. Am I going over time? Am I okay? You're amongst friends. <laughs> uh, we partner with Newington Housing Association down at Camberwell Court. It's mainly, it's sheltered, supported living for older people. An amazing bunch of volunteers down there. So just to mention those guys as well, they've been going for about 10 years. Amazing bunch. All through COVID and everything. And then our, our collaboration with Anaka Women's Collective that Reshma is part of. And that's Elfie there. I don't know if any of you know Elfie. She's away in her travels, and that's Reshma. Um, so, yeah, that's been really exciting for us. And there's Riona, who's over here, <laughs> tasting the sweet corn that we grew in the garden, didn't we, Riona? Um, <laughs> was it good? Was it nice, sweet corn? It was good, yeah. Good. Um, so, the Anaka Women's Collective, Women's Collective um, it's a, how many women are in Anaka, Reshma, do you know? Uh, nearly 300 now. 300. Uh -huh. So there's about 50 of them are linked, about 40 linked in with us and they either come occasionally or we have a group of about probably 20 who are really stalwarts and their kids. So it's chaos on school holidays. Um, and so we do foraging walks like this one over here. We've made a film at the garden. We've done all sorts with lots of helpers. Um, and then kind of another spin-off from Anaka that we're sort of involved in is the Cultured Club, Darvila Reynolds, from, who lives in Hollywood, uh, is currently based out of the vault in East Belfast. She had a company called the Cultured Club. She wanted to make it more of a community venture and so now it's called the Multicultured Club. <laughs> and uh, they're collaborating with Anaka Women's Collective to make fermented foods, very healthy. Um, you can hopefully buy them in, in a shop near you uh, or online very, very soon. And that the proceeds from that eventually will go back into like a, a, a crisis fund for women who are not able to work um, because they're in the very cruel asylum system. The conscious cruelty in that system is, is real, you know, it's, it's just disgraceful. Like, and these are all women with so many skills and so much to offer. And uh, and so um, it's money for like childcare, driving lessons, training courses that they can't access at the moment. So hopefully down the line that will be happening. And uh, and that's us. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you, uh, Pauline from the People's Republic of North Down, <laughs> or otherwise known as the Haves and the Haviots. Uh, we thank you to see that permaculture is now spreading. So I'd like to introduce now Louise from the Ladder East Belfast. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, the only reason I came tonight was because I wanted to fan girl Pauline and because we follow the grow on um, social media and really admire what those guys have been doing. Um, so it's great just to meet her and to be here. 
Um, I'm not great with technology, as my uh, colleague will attest to, so I'm going to hopefully paint a picture for you uh, using some words initially, all right? So this, um, my colleague wrote this, and it was drawing together some of the stories that we have seen in the larder. It shouldn't have to be like this. We'd love to be put out of business. There's a man at the larder quietly turning down chilled food, making himself small and avoiding our eyes. Moving silently through the shop, he fills his basket with some tinned meatballs and packet noodles. Tommy, why don't you take some milk and cereal, Gemma asks. He politely declines, but Gemma is savvy. She's been through too much herself to let this one slide. Something's up and she's got the right kind of nature to get him talking. After a few more questions, Tommy says he hasn't been able to keep his fridge running. The electric costs too much. I think we can help with this. Let me go talk to the bosses at the back. This is the first moment Tommy makes eye contact. He looks up with tears. He says firmly, <coughs> somber, don't you embarrass me, please. But Gemma puts him at ease and speed walks her way past two young dads fumbling their way through a pile of nappies, trying to figure the right size. Right to the back, where she takes a moment to compose herself before recalling the encounter to me. Witnessing this kind of struggle takes its toll on the team. It shouldn't have to be like this. Of course, we'd love to be put out of business. Meanwhile, a familiar face from Instagram sticks her head through the side door and calls Ali outside. When she sees Amber Lee, she gives a big smile and follows her out. It's Amber Lee's turn to deliver the groceries that Oakfield Drive collects together as a street. But it's the first time she's seen a queue forming at our front door and she is overwhelmed by this sight. There's tears and a hug, which still feels a little risky as it's the COVID regulations that has us asking people to queue outside. But there's this sense of connection here from one street to another. The despair is catching, but it also breeds a kind of solidarity. It shouldn't have to be like this. Of course, we'd love to be put out of business. Back inside on another night, Alison, a volunteer, is encouraging a regular of ours to sign a postcard demanding emergency measures for the cost of living crisis. Stephanie signs the card no bother, but when we flip it over and encourage her to put her own words down, she's stumped. I don't know what I'd say, she shrugs and slides the postcard back to Alison. Stephanie is a recently single mother her two little ones are at home here in the larder. The wee boy chases the cat while her daughter makes eyes at the treat box until someone says, ah, go on. Stephanie is also pregnant. This will be her third child. Alison pushes the postcard back to Steph and points out the fourth item in our list of demands. Scrap the two child limit. I suppose that one is important for you, Stephanie. You'll have another child to feed soon. There's this tiny moment of connection, a flicker. It's fleeting, but it's ignited long enough for her to write down this. Child tax credit for every child, child benefit needs to be up. When Ali is sorting through the postcards later, it would be easy for her to dismiss this one. There's not a personal voice in it, no anger, just a handful of words really. But she wonders if Stephanie is worn down by the years of austerity cuts rolled out with flagrant disregard for the unpaid work of care. Decisions that have worked against her flourishing. Or, she wonders, if she never really knew to expect anything better in the first place. It shouldn't have to be like this. Of course we'd love to be put out of business. Except, we've stopped saying that now, because there's more to each of these stories. Tommy got his electric bill topped up with us, he started coming regularly and even offered lifts to others who had a long way to walk with their weekly shop from the larder. He got a job recently and just a few weeks ago we encouraged him to talk to a journalist about his experiences. He makes eye contact with us readily and we really hope that he's realised he has nothing to be embarrassed about. The shame isn't on him, it's with those that have made policy decisions that have pushed him further into debt. And the two dads figuring out nappy sizes? One was Polish and the other is inner East Belfast born and bred. We've all been told a lot of things about those two demographics of young men, 
But these stereotypes, those stereotypes are defied by the spectacle we have in the larder, when they both put language and cultural barriers aside to help each other figure out what size of nappies they need. There's a lot of gesturing as they try and show how high up from the floor their kid is. It's got them both laughing and eventually they come to a consensus and send us searching up the back for their decided upon sizes. There are hundreds of little micro connections like this that happen in the larder that don't take place in your average Tesco or little. The faces here are familiar, their struggles are worn on those faces and there's also so much laughter and people rarely go away without having had a proper chat with someone. So we've stopped saying we want to be put out of business and started building upon our strengths and really meaning business. We stopped defining those we encounter by their deficits and started framing them by their assets. We stopped referring to people as clients or service users and we've invited them to become members. And controversially, we've stopped giving people ongoing free food. And instead, we have together agreed upon an affordable shop, harnessing the collective buying power and sourcing local nutritious food that is guaranteed weekly. I mean, our business model sucks. There's no profit margins here and we'd be stumped without the support of donations to bulk, to bulk out those shops. But the payment is way more than a token gesture. It is a step towards resilience and sustainability. No more leftover food for leftover people. So when we opened in 2013, um, we, we thought we were doing the right thing, that we were part of a small faith community uh, meeting in a disused church in East Belfast and um, we thought we were doing the right thing because people were hungry and people had come to us looking for food and we thought what should we do of course we know what we'll do we'll open up a food bank and we became one of the the myriad of food banks right across Great Britain that extend to more food banks than there are McDonald's in this country and that's a statistic that some um, politicians were boasting about. We don't find that anything to boast about at all. Um, and politicians turning up at food bank stores to open them is another thing we do not encourage. Um, and so for a long time, that was the model we were working with. But it didn't always fit easily with us. Um, as we became more and more aware that no matter how hard you tried, no matter what you wanted to do about, oh, we need to give people dignity, we must reduce stigma, and I mean, the way we give people dignity was by offering them choice when they came to the food bank. We would put their shop, their food out and allow them to choose what they took. But nothing could change the fact that this was people having to come and give up all agency to stand before us and say, can I have some food, please? And so while we are um, wholly supported by the local community, um, by churches, local businesses, individuals, streets. Um, there is a power balance that exists that does not build community. There is this balance of power between those in the upper leafy suburbs of East Belfast, up around Stormont, who have plenty of money, who can come down with their parcel of groceries and walk away having received thanks and gratitude and feel better for having done their bit. And then there's the group of people from inner East Belfast who show up on our doorstep and look ashamed and embarrassed and have to ask for help and have to, do, have to make do with someone else's choice of food or someone else's idea of what um, is nice. And when it comes to fresh food and vegetables, often it's the dregs. So if you've ever worked with Fair Share, God bless the big supermarkets and fair share and their ability to use waste and, you know, let's not have waste. Let's give it to all those who can't afford food. Let's give it the leftover stuff to the people that we don't care about. And in the meantime, we can put it on our box and take our, I'm, I'm getting on my other soapbox now. Um, we can take our boxes and um, say we've done that for our waste, we've done that for our community. And yet they avoid having to dispose of that waste and pay the cost of that. And they make those community groups take on the burden of that and the disposal of the waste that doesn't get it. <coughs> That's a whole other story. So we spent a lot of time wondering how were we, what were we going to do? How could we make this different? And we explored other models and we looked at what other people were doing. Um, and so in June of last year, we finally made the jump 
into um, what we call a, f a community food hub. Um, some people have called them social supermarkets. Um, we don't really want to use that term because actually this is an evolving thing for us and we are here um, trying to learn from other people. We've come probably with more questions than we have answers, but we have a general direction that we want to head in. And when I see what you guys are doing and some of the values that you have, hold, you know, it makes my heart sing, Pauline, and I'm thinking, yes, this is what we need. So when someone becomes a member with the Larder, it costs them five pounds a year to sign up. And for that, for that membership fee of five pounds a year, when they arrive, they get a, a laundry egg. I don't know if anyone uses laundry eggs, but um, we are very keen that we do our bit for the environment and, and climate change and help people be able to participate in all of that. And so we want to make it as easy as possible for people to join in with the conversation around climate change and with doing, you know, their bit. So they all get a laundry egg, which will do them for 70 washes, and then they can come back and get it refilled. So very cheap and good for the planet. They also got some produce bags for them to be able to, um, that friends of ours made for them, and then they can, um, their produce can go into these produce bags when they take them away. Um, we decided that instead of just relying on what is given to us and donated to us, we would be much more um, careful about what people could know would always be in place. So we get fresh, um, fresh bread, fresh milk, and fresh fruit and vegetables. And we've done that in collaboration with local businesses. Because another thing that we are really keen about is community wealth building. And I know what we do is minimal, but it's this idea that we do not want to keep investing in the big supermarkets. We want to give to our local community. So we um, have partnered with the Bethany Fruit Shop um, on the Creek Road, and we go and we get our fruit, fresh fruit and veg from them. Um, and we always ask them to source as locally as possible so that they're giving us the stuff that is local. Um, and that's all paid for. So we pay, you know, we just use the money that's donated to us to give them the money. So a small business is given our business. We have a local uh, milkman who, again, you know, he delivers to us and he gets his milk and we, um, so as much as possible, I mean, it is limited, but as much as possible, we try to engage with the local community and local businesses. Um, the dream, of course, is like, and this is one of the questions that we keep asking ourselves, how does East Belfast feed itself? Because this is a question now for everybody. And I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we can just sit back and um, not worry about this. This is a climate issue. You know, it is a social justice issue. Um, it is an issue of, um, you know, being able to, the, the right to food and the right to good food. Um, so how does East Belfast feed itself? And that is the question that we're grappling with. Um, we have dabbled with um, um, floor bed, not floor beds, allotment beds, sorry, I think, allotment beds that we have outside of our building. But without the infrastructure and without that, we learned very quickly that without somebody who could really invest in that, it, it's a difficult task. Um, and so, but two years ago, we partnered up with um, the Edible Floor, who would, um, they have a small holding and they, um, would sell their goods to local delis and things, but they came down and planted out our beds for us in the most amazing, like, salads, um, salad leaves. And we had gorgeous bags of salads all summer long, grown right outside our door, that people could take away and add in with their, um, the meals that they had. Um, and then last year we did try and plant again, but it was a disaster and our beds are a disgrace. And can't really talk about that. But <laughs> what would it, we, we are in conversations with people about how do we link in with growers and, and people who have skills. I am neither a grower nor a cook, would you believe? And the, I cannot believe I'm standing here talking to it. This is my daily job is talking about growing things and cooking things. Um, but um, I do love... Um, I do love what um, other people are doing and we're trying to link in with them and see how we can grow those relationships. And I've often wondered what would it look like if um, East Belfort, if we had patchwork farms, you know, where Mrs. Jones in number 62 grew the carrots and Mr. Smith in number 94 <coughs> grew the potatoes. And we started to use that pooled resources and those um, spaces that are there, you know, to, 
to bring food together and feed ourselves as a community. So very much like what you've been saying, John, we um, feel that our role is, it, it is threefold. I'm, it's become very difficult for it not to be threefold. Our first, where we came from, was that meeting immediate need. Now, we have tried to step away from that, um, and that sounds really harsh, but there are lots of food banks now in the city, and I don't really think they need us. But if someone comes to our door and is in need, well, then we do, we do help them, and then we will refer them on to a local food bank. Um, the second is that this looking upstream, and you know, to that end, we have been engaging with anti-poverty issues in around East Belfast and um, trying to engage with some of the politicians. Um, we did our Postcards to Power series recently, whereby we got people who were using the larder um, to sign postcards with their experiences. And then we, um, we mostly at the moment, my, my colleague Ali uh, was managing all of this and she put them on Twitter constantly and would have them on Twitter and tagging all the MPs or MLA, sorry, rather in it um, to get a wee bit of traction. Um, but that, and now she's like, not quite sure what I have to do with these now. So we have given them to our local alliance, MLA, and he's way off now to think about what to do with these. But these are people's lived experiences um, of how the cost of living um, is affecting them, what it, that the experience has been like for them and seeking the help that they need. Um, and so we, we believe in all of that upstream stuff and engaging with the, um, those conversations, but that's not going to change in a, in a day. You know, we need something else. And this is where we've come upon this middle ground whereby we have a membership model. But we're very aware that we're still, if all we do is, um, um, create a membership for people who have lived experience of poverty. We don't actually really address anything. So our next step, and this step keeps getting kicked further up the road because it gets more and more terrifying, but our next step is to um, create a second membership tier called, um, our first membership tier is Samson membership, our second membership tier is Goliath membership. You can see what I did there. Um, and Goliath membership is for people who um, might very well be using, you know, or could afford to use the local supermarkets, but that they are people who do have an interest in social justice. They are people who do have an interest in climate justice. They are people who have an interest in, you know, thinking differently about how we do things and inviting them to come along and be part of a, a, I suppose, a food buying group, really, where we can buy things in bulk. Uh, our Samson members will have access to everything that is available in the larder. Um, our Goliath members will have access to the things that have been purchased in bulk and that they will then purchase themselves um, at, at a little over cost price. And that money will then go back and, you know, help fund everything and keep things going. We're asking people though to build community and I think that's what you're saying pulling out of all of this because I, I agree you know warm banks are a horrendous idea the fact that people have to use food banks is a horrendous idea but actually community is a really good idea and when people come together you know um, and you know if, if warm banks in some ways are bringing people together so there's that community if there's a positive that's it, it draws people out of their homes and into community. Um, so as we, as we move forward, that's the next phase for us. Um, we also, we've just introduced our little um, like uh, spice and um, herb and spice uh, little, I can't remember what it's called now. Yeah, herb and spice. So people can come in and they can uh, lift uh, a couple of teaspoons of their herbs or spices that they need to make their food more flavoursome. Um, and again, that can be added in. So little waste, you get what you need and you go on. Uh, the next step is to do um, some uh, green cleaning products, you know, much cheaper than you know, when you make your own. So that'll be the next thing. We'll show people how to do that and that could be part of their weekly shop as well. Um, so we have lots of these ideas and then building on that, the element of community with community meals, um, community events, um, grow, you know, moving into the growing and um, thinking about how we use our waste products. Um, uh, and that is 
something that is for everybody. So all members are included in that, this idea that we draw people in from um, all the different demo demographics, um, social demographics, and draw them in together and create a space where those barriers can be broken down, where people can actually get to meet each other and engage with one another. Um, so those are some of the things that I say we're not there, we're, it's a direction of travel for us towards, you know, what asking the questions about uh, food sustainability, um, asking the questions about what our role is in climate change, asking our que uh, the question about what our role is in um, providing equality within society. Um, and we're just, I suppose one of the things that we are keen to do is to stop reducing poverty to like individual things you know, like heat you know fuel poverty and techno you know uh food poverty and i heard bed poverty recently and it's like it's just all poverty it, you know it's like uh, um you know let's just call it what it is and it shouldn't be like this in this country it really shouldn't um so yeah, so that's where we are at. It is the start of a journey and, and something that we hope we can collaborate with others on and um, learn from what other people are doing. Um, so thank you. That's great. Take uh, questions from the, from the floor. Um, and maybe while people are thinking of questions or comments they might want to make, I can't help but thinking that for both of your projects, they are about growing community. And it's almost like what Pauline's doing is like producing food and you're kind of distributing it. And in there, there might be a, you know, an alternative um, food system for, for our cities. But also, I, I think the, um, the idea of connecting particular issues like both you talked about the climate and environmental issues, but in a way that makes sense to working class people because too often that language is seen as off-putting, it's elitist and it's um, scientific and so on. Whereas in, in many respects, there was a, a kind of a working class, practical environmentalism. It's not ideology, it just makes common sense in a way. And I do think that shot through with what both of your projects are about is about dignity and community. But I can't help but notice, but a lot of women you know, it seems to be once again, it's women putting their shoulder to the wheel in terms of dealing with these, um, you know, unmet needs that the state, you're quite rightly uh, pointing out, you're filling a gap that we shouldn't have. But the reality is that's where we're at. So listen, thank you both for your presentation. So I'm going to hand it over to the audience. There is a, a mic here. So before you uh, speak, just wait till I come to you with the mic. So who'd like to, to start? Yes, Caroline. Hi, Pauline. I just wanted to check with you. Can you hear me? You probably can without yes. that. Um, you mentioned that you were working on a piece of vacant land, and I was, my ears were pricking up there. I wonder who owns that land. <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> if you I'm start not, me, I can speak. For no, no, we're not. We're not. Land. We're not starting you, Bridge. I'm asking <laughs> Pauline. Don't. So the the piece of land I think I was talking about was probably the big site in West Belfast. Yeah. So that's owned by the Department for Communities currently. Okay, are they okay about you just weighing in there and doing stuff? No, no. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not. They're, no, they are in the process of handing it over to the council. It's oh, it's yeah. a pain in Could their... Could take a while. It's a pain in their head, <laughs> really. Um, at the moment, the, um, it's actually the regeneration office. So that in as far as I understand, in DFC, there's the people with responsibility for housing and then there's the regeneration crew, Belfast Regeneration mm -hmm. Office, is that right? So is your plan basically so just to do stuff while it's stuck in some sort of bureaucratic wasteland? Well our plan, I mean the campaigners who are working on that site, the plan is that there would be public housing of some oh, sort, okay. publicly supported, publicly funded housing mm -hmm. that would be um, also uh, sustainable housing. That is, that's what the campaigners want. And in the meantime, you know, we're kind of thinking, well, you know, it's like um, Naha Bridani is the motto that they use and that they have up at Gap, at Guardian and Fubble, is don't talk about it, let's just, just do, do it. it yeah. What are we waiting on these guys for? Fuck the planet will be burnt to the ground, you know, yeah, by the yeah, time yeah, yeah, yeah. 
all Very those pol and there's great policies and there really are fantastic policies written but there just seems to be a bit of a, a mismatch between making this happen any on the ground. Is there communication between yourselves and the people making the policies? Uh, oh, oh my god like uh, reams of efforts. Hello. Reams of efforts to engage yeah. Okay <coughs> um, I'm sure there's loads of other questions so the one like? word here is that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Just get on and do it. Any other uh, comment? Well, I think I might talk about unadopted <laughs> alleys. <laughs> get ready, Alan. <laughs> Seven years ago, we started Wildflower Alley, one of the first in Belfast. Now there's a lot and a lot of green spaces, <coughs> which proved to be an absolute boon to people during lockdown. Mm. Just for mental health, all kinds. We started a second project on Horsey Hill off Annadale Embankment leading up to Agincourt Avenue, a very historic area where the horses and carts used to bring the goods up into the city of Belfast. This is an unadopted alley. There's a hundred of them in Belfast. Belfast and other cities are major contributors to global warming. Mm -hmm. Having green spaces is a major factor that will decrease that. City Council need to be doing something about these unadopted alleys. Politically, they've talked about it and literally are afraid to do anything. So we decided to clean out uh, Horsey Hill, which we did with groups of local teenagers, kids, parents, everybody. But when we started to do anything on it, we tried to get trees on it. Oh my God, the tree man was petrified. <laughs> We tried to put planters on it. The community gardener kept bringing his plants and going, it's not going on Horsey Hill, is it? And I was thinking, what is the problem? We're in a city that the city council says they don't own major portions of land. What are we paying rates for? We're paying rates for land that... So it's a disgrace. It's just a disgrace. So there's nothing we can do about Horsey Hill. If you put a piece of paper on it, like at nervous breakdown time, and actually, the hill itself is used as a shortcut. Queen's PEC, people walk up into the Holy Land. There's no lights, there's nothing. If it's not a health and safety mm. issue, I don't know what is. But the issue of not owning land, mm. the DFI and the council, they say once they take it over, they're liable for claims and people are going to fall and make big claims. It's not about ownership, it's about them being mm -hmm. responsible. Years ago, uh, they used to hand over land, actually, if it wasn't used. I know it's happened in West Belfast. People <coughs> took it for their back gardens. This happened. Yeah. But now City Council has got this phobia about health and safety, and I just think it's, it's such a disgrace. So we can't go anywhere near Horsey Hill. We can't drop a piece of paper on it, because the council would instantly become, or the DFI, liable and it's really holding back communities. Well, I think there's a theme here about the unused assets of our city. Hi, uh, my name is, just people who don't know me, I'm Brian Payne, editor of a Social Affairs magazine view. Uh, it's great to hear the two contributions there, <laughs> because a, a good while ago, I'd done stuff around the Grove project, and Pauline, I've met Pauline, we're down at the Larder, and it's good not just to hear that they're still here, but actually they're expanding and talking and having those conversations. Because I've always thought that food banks were an obscenity. Mm. I just think they're obscenity. And what happened was they just became part of the fabric because the sturdy was so hard, people were hungry, people in desperation were going to them. Politicians were being photographed outside of them, talking about up them. I mean, I heard a Conservative MP on Radio 4 this morning when, I, when I'm not turning it off. <laughs> And he was ta we were talking about free school meals. He's been asked the question, should there be more free school meals? He says, well, you know, under our policies, we have another, um, you know, 200,000 children eligible for these. And I thought, does he not get the irony of what he's saying? He's boasting that there's more children who need free school meals. So my little contribution here, basically, um, anybody who knows us, we do themed magazines, the journalism. So the next one is, I've just finished one there on housing, and the next one is on the cost of living crisis. What I'm going to try to do with this one, but people can judge whether it succeeds or not, is just not have what the mainstream media have a lot, to go to somebody to say they're really hungry, they're really starving, they're really desperation. The reporter gets the story, the package goes out, 
and life moves on. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, or a politician has asked something. Because I worked in the media for a long time in newspapers, I know how it's made, I know how it's done. You know, I, I understand the process of it. And when I say it, I said, God, I wish I had their resources. Because if nothing else, you'd watch the news that night if I had those resources, without a doubt. Um, so I'm going to try and do two things with it, and anyone can talk to me, John knows mm. contact details, me, whatever. I'm going to have some stories of people who are in difficulty, because that's real lived experience, and those voices have to be heard. But what I'm really looking for, and I hate the word solutions, I really don't like it at all. You know, I'm a socialist as well as a journalist, so I, I understand what I want as a social society. I always understood that from 16 years of age. Um, but in the meantime, as a journalist, I, what I want in that magazine is to say it doesn't have to be hopelessness. The, the, the reality is there that people are going through bloody difficult, tough times. But there is alternatives to that. It doesn't have to be like that all the time. And that's the conversations, to use another phrase that people use a lot, <laughs> conversations. That's what we need to have. And we need to have them not rallies at the City Hall. If I go to another rally at the City Hall, I think I'm going to scream. Yeah. And really, what we need is big events somewhere, and all those voices, the grow, the larder, lots of other projects, PPR, but lots of them, and in a room with all those voices and having those big discussions, like big discussions about the cost of living crisis and what do we want as working class people? What is it that we want? That, to me, would be a step in the right direction. Those big events where people put forward their ideas and debate, etc., and something may emerge out of that. That, that. That's kind of the area that I'm looking at. But as I say, for the magazine, I'm interested in uh, people approaching me, talking to me, whatever, been interviewed or writing for the magazine. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I've talked too much as usual. Okay, thanks, Brian. Okay, thank our, you. Thanks, Brian. Over at Pauline or uh, Louise, would like to respond in terms of the the direction that Brian is indicating our response, anything that Caroline or Bridge has said. It sounds like, I mean, everybody seems to be on the same page. It's not going to change unless we do it ourselves. We can't wait, you know, for people with power to change things because it's just not happening. And um, I don't know what we're all going to do, but I think we everybody has something to offer, you know, and uh, there's a lot we can do. Really, we, we did a big event in August, uh, Grow and PPR, and uh, and it was around that site in West Belfast. We did the first day was like a conference. We invited all of the powers that be to that. It, a lot of them <coughs> didn't, most of them didn't come. Um, and the second day was about practical actions, you know, things that people can do. That was really well attended. It was really exciting day, and people kind of went away inspired with ideas and I think we just need lots more of that of just doing it you know and uh, we just have to get on with it like um, yeah. I mean, no, it's just that there is something too about uh, how do we get people with lived experience of poverty and who, who are suffering the most how do we get them angry mm -hmm. about what's happening to them because they don't even know to be angry mm -hmm. and they you know giving them the opportunity to speak for themselves and to it's it, yeah I mean th those are the voices that we really want to hear but they, they, they learn helplessness mm -hmm. well it's, it's beaten down as yeah. well you know you're beaten down you're in survival mode constantly so. yeah oh yeah you're gone again but yes, uh, what, what if we are the people we've been waiting for? But it's kind of hard to imagine, you know, the end of the world when you can't think about getting to the end of the week. Yeah. I mean, and there's a lot of social science research now that that period of austerity from 2007, <coughs> 2008 killed thousands of people. Excess deaths as a direct result of that policy of austerity. But the constant stress on people's minds, it literally reconfigures the actual brain, particularly when it's developing. And I think we underestimate that omnipresent sense of, of the stress of poverty, which, of course, of which the ultimate cause of it is always for me. I don't like talking about poverty. I want to talk about inequality. Poverty is the effect. Mm. The, the cause is the inequality in society. So we're kind of all in, in the same uh, page, as it were. But anybody else like to um, come in? I just think it's interesting that, interesting that all the projects that started 
end up with social solidarity as an outcome. Because <laughs> we didn't think at the beginning that this was about social solidarity. Um, it was vacant land, mm. get gates, do the gardening. And you find more and more as you go on, people learn things, people come along and meet others. Mm. People get their head shard, as they say, sitting and talking. Absolutely. And it builds the social okay. solidarity. So I think talking about social solidarity, changing the terminology, and really not having all the cost of poverty stories, it just gets more and more demoralizing. Uh -huh. To hear people say how awful it is, it gets more and more demoralizing. So solution you know, focusing on solutions and what people can do, it's just interesting that that's the way we've all orientated it naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just a conversation starter, I think. Mm -hmm. A lovely thing happened in um, in Guardian and Fubble actually, which was so the group was meeting there, and <coughs> this young fella, he's about twenty one only. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's called Aaron Kelly, and he is just passionate about Black Mountain. He's from White Rock. Katie's nodding because you've met him. Have you met him? He's um, so he pretty much lives in the mountain. He knows everything that moves on the mountain. He has reintroduced pine martens pretty much single-handedly really um, and he has this kind of vision that he wants a wildlife corridor from Black Mountain to Carn Money and he's doing it he's just going up there and he's now got a job in Ulster Wildlife Trust the reason he got the job was so he could buy nuts and feed for the Pine Martins he, he needs his money to do what he wants to do and so he came down and did a talk in the garden in White Rock and uh, there was a bunch of kids there and we made bird tables and um, and he talked about the importance of us feeding the birds at the garden because he has his vision and he, he said this, he's 21, he said, Me, I probably won't see these birds, but I want eagles on that hill again. I want eagles on that mountain again. And I, maybe I won't see it, maybe you kids will see it. I really hope you do. But that's what we want to do. And we were like at the garden, we were like, what can we do? Claire, the gardener was like, how can we help you make this vision happen? And so the following week, a big posse went up into the mountain. The landowner there, she's a, um, a very uh, sympathetic farmer, said, you can put a pond in there. He said, there's not enough invertebrates for the newts to uh, yeah. breed. So a big posse of young fellas and us from the garden went up with the shovels. And now there's a pond in that field. And another thing that came out of it was he was like, there's not enough we can't get the trees we need to plant in the mountain for this corridor. We were like, well, there's two derelict allotments over there. That is now a tree nursery. And um, and so the last few months, the volunteers at the garden have been, we were over there one day, uh, putting acorns, sprouting acorns and planting them and uh, clearing it and rowing. I grew up in the area and whenever we were young, you know, there was newts and there was all the things that goes with, a mountain and of late there hasn't been so this young man he wants to try and um, put everything together again mm. and let nature take its course and so he's um, he's going to be planting trees at the hat what is a hatchet field you call it because it's the shape of a hatchet mm. and you can see it in West Belfast from anywhere you can see the shape of it you know and we did have a spring before, a small spring, but it's in with a farmer now. Uh, years ago, we called it the waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> and it was about that high and water gushing out of it. And we were all, we thought, you know, it's the waterfall. But anyway, so that's, and he is, he's doing a great job. He really is. So. Uh, uh, great. I mean, it's a common theme across everything we're, we're um, talking about. It seems to me that people place and then of course the planet you want to say all coming uh, together uh, in this way i mean just partly riffing off what brian was saying and as somebody who just found out yesterday i'm a proud unionist uh, yes a trade unionist as i always say not the other type um but our union is going to go on strike for three days this week as are many other unions I mean, just today the royal college of nursing first time ever there's going to be a lot of strike action and here's a a, a wild idea and just in, in terms of we're going to be dock pay because we're not working. That's the essence of strike. And we usually end up on a picket line outside that I really don't see often the utility of. Is there some way that some union members who are on strike can go and volunteer and work 
in some of these projects. And the days we're doing strike action, mm. we're actually doing something socially productive as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which I think, it be, even if it's like a, a symbolic of, I, I just think there's something quite um, powerful in that. Sweet of, bar, like yeah, <laughs> of people coming together. We'll you feed know. you if you care. Yeah. So uh, think about that in terms of, you know, I, I'm representing University Colleges Union here, so I can't speak for the RCN or Unite or NIPSA or the other units. But, uh, but there does seem to be something quite interesting in that in terms of us being able to do something different. We're, not, we're withdrawing our labour from our employer, as every worker has the right to, but now we're offering that to uh, different groups and so on. Anyway, who else would like to come we in? Who? Tomorrow, no? no, the twenty. Oh, there's all the students in the in the room. Twenty fourth and twenty fifth, and the thirtieth of November. Uh, anybody else who'd like to uh, come in? Yes, sure. <coughs> Instead of all the protests, why don't all the people that are doing the protesting? I mean, it's good to protest too, but why don't they do something practical? Mm -hmm. And instead of yeah. just protesting, because we do need the stuff yeah. immediate, you yeah. know. Uh -huh. So talking and talking about it instead of doing uh -huh. isn't, uh -huh. you know, it's not full filling yeah. the thing or filling people's stomachs either. Uh -huh. yeah. And my poor scholar's hands can get, can get calloused <laughs> and get a bit of honest labour. Um, can I just ask on a practical level where your project is, the, the larder in East Belfast? Um, at Mersey Street, so it's right in front of the Oval Football Ground where Glen Torren play. Mm -hmm. So just off D Street. Right. Did they knock? Sorry, did they knock down the primary school there? No, no, it was turned into social housing. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, just, uh, hold on, Brian. Hold on. Sorry. He'll, he'll have me go to our garters. Just, just very briefly, there, uh, journalist firm, not know you, but also I've been a very active trade unionist. I, I have to. I, have to I, mean, I like the idea of doing that voluntary work, but um, you know, if I was Queen's University lecture or the, that was out to strike, what I would do is is take over the university that day. <laughs> That's what I would do. I'd take over the university, and when I took over the university that day, had that sit in. I would invite all you to it as well and have those discussions in the university. And dig up the front of the lanyard and start growing things. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just saying, that's what, I, that's, that's what I would be arguing uh -huh. if I was having these. Not us going to them, them coming to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Because uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. you have the university, it's a public space, it's paid out of public taxes, mm -hmm. and, and, and that space, you imagine the impact that would have, and, and the, the grow and the larder and all those groups come to it on that day. Yeah, that to me, that would be, uh, mm -hmm. be interesting. <laughs> and I would cover it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you would. <laughs> okay. I'll Any, leave it there. Anybody You're else? There <laughs> <laughs> the protests actually need, I mean, I, we have been out on some of the protests, um, but they're not well attended. No. So when you think about it, it's like, what is the issue here? Now, the one comment I would make if anyone's interested, but that actually the language used in protests can yeah. be very alienating. And mm -hmm. um, because if you're somebody who's new, and there are people, sorry, there are people having these conversations, there are people who have been very comfortably off for a very long time and are now thinking, this is not right. And they mm -hmm. are trying to find their feet in terms of how do we, you know, protest or what do we say about this? And yet when you go to a protest and someone calls you comrade and stuff like that, it's like, <gasps> Do you know, it's like, what have I entered here? And there is something about the language that is used because um, if we want more people to protest, I think we need to make it more inclusive and understand that there are people here who are not used to that. They're not, they are not communists. Mm. You know, they might not even describe themselves as socialists, but they want to make a difference now. And it's how we bring yeah. those people into that conversation, I think is really important. Yeah. Mm. I think, yeah, it's basically about giving people something very practical to do, mm. rather than shouting. Mm. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, you know, I can't help but think that, you know, there's, is it, the, 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 it was a bishop in Brazil that was killed by the Bra Brazilian Junta, and Dom Heda Camara was his name, and he said, and I, you probably know the phrase, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. <laughs> but when I ask where the poor have no food, they call me a communist. <laughs> and I, I fully accept that language, comrade, socialism, social. But it doesn't mean, in particular, Christianity, I think, has a natural affinity 
with that ideas of social justice and yes. so on. Well, um, e evangelical Christianity though has it's, it, it has perpetuated. The, well, they'll get on to another soapbox sure, then, uh, but that is, uh -huh. you know, the evangelicalism has perpetuated that. You can say, yeah, I mean, Christianity at its very core should be about sure. socialism and, you know, but evangelicalism has gone the other way. It's about, yeah. Aye. But, but my sense is, if you look at the, the rise of, of trade union activism, and all praise Mick Lynch thought, he's mm. done so much, I think, to uh, mm. raise that issue of reminding people that if you have to sell your labour, you're a worker and that you know we've had uh, masked often by cheap credit so if anybody's interested the next tuesday um Teresa and myself and the center that is hosting tonight we have a weekly tuesday evening lecture and each week we're looking at a different uh, aspect of the crisis that we're facing so the climate crisis but next week it's about debt yes. and money and actually for a long time the uh, wages weren't increasing as inflation increased, so that was a real wage decrease, but it was masked by people getting into debt. Mm. And that's still a hangover, and it, it's a major issue in our society because we now have paramilitary crime organisations who are using this now to continue their coercive control. I mean, it's one of the, the shames that nice uh, middle class, and indeed in the media, we don't get enough of. The conflict may be over here in Northern Ireland at one level, for many working class communities, it isn't over. It's just morphed into something different. Mm -hmm. And actually what we have is, what I would say, because this really is now going off on a different issue, but it is connected. It shows you all these things are connected. I would say what we have here in parts of Northern Ireland, working class communities, is paramilitary peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's something that we, we don't have enough attention about. It's almost like we have a... I don't know what this phrase means that in any way, a Potemkin village of a peace process. All looks lovely and nice now with our shiny cafes and, and so on, and the barriers aren't there, and we're not being searched going into shops, but you go into a lot of working class communities and you'll find, you know, where's the peace dividend? And so I'd say what this is, is connected to that. And uh, well, like Brian, I don't like that idea of solutions. It's a very male way, oh, pull yourself together, it's gonna to be a solution. What we're dealing with here, I think, are coping mechanisms. There are necessary ways of people to cope uh, and so on, and they are really important for people's sense of, again, something that's come up in, in the conversation, agency. That idea, I really like that idea you were talking about, Louise, in terms of giving people back agency to the new kind of business model that you're developing, that they don't feel like supplicants, so they don't feel like they're, you know, you're giving them arms and, and they have no uh, choice and so on. But for me, um, hope is always generated through agency. Hopelessness is where you're so worn down that you, you, you're, just, you're just lacking literally any energy, uh, that you can't actually do anything. And that's where, just to finish on this bit of a rift that I'm on, it's partly what I often say at all these events we host here at Queen's, I am a privileged knowledge worker. I'm paid from your taxes. Brian is quite right. This institution is a public institution paid out of taxes. So in any of the activities that anybody here is involved in, in an organisation, as an individual, please let me know if you'd like to book a room. <coughs> We're able, you know, I can give you Brian's magazine to find some funding to help with some of the initiatives. This institution is incredibly wealthy, incredibly wealthy, even just in terms of the, the spaces that are unused every day of the week, every weekend, and we've got organisations in our city that could use it. So please see this as an open invitation for you to consider, would you like to have a, a meeting here, a venue, you know, would you like to have a bit of scran? That, that's next time, Theresa, we should always have, that's my, one thing I learned at seven years as a local councillor, if you're gonna have a meeting, make sure you've got some food, so we'll promise next time we'll get some food for you. But it is something that I think should be where privileged people like me, who, I'm not gonna suffer the worst impacts of the cost of living crisis. I'm a well-paid university professor, um, and there are many like us, I wish that there were more of us now that were using that privilege um, for, for good, but certainly the institution itself and its buildings and so on um, should be put to purpose for uh, the activities that other people are involved in. But uh, before I draw things to a close, is anybody who hasn't <coughs> spoken yet who'd like to, to speak? Or, yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, on a Wednesday, we have 15... Um, different nationalities come and initially they come really quietly and sheepishly and 
they ju they're just, you know, f finding their feet. And by the time they're there six weeks, because of the friendship and the welcome that everybody gets, and even though in some cases their, their language is not yeah. good, um, every week y you see them learning and learning. And every week we also have a meal at the end of it. Mm -hmm. It could be a load of vegetables, three and a pot, mm -hmm. and a pot of soup and the bed around everybody. But um, it's so, so well. It's just a, um, like a safe place and a safe space yeah. for, for us all to get on together and everything to be ah. happy and contented. Great. Well put, well put. So I don't know whether our, either of our speakers would like to have any last comments before we, we close off in terms of reflecting on, on the discussion or things that weren't said or anything else you'd like to say? Well, well you're... Oh, my, sorry, I've got, yeah. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say, I'm sure some of us maybe know Mary McManus. Do you know yes. Mary? Yes, Mary. Mary, I always feel like I need to bang Mary's drum for her and those two things are about the real living wage mm -hmm. that everybody should be paying, including Queen's Queen, University oh no. Belfast, yeah. um, and also community wealth building. And community wealth building um, is where the money is kept within the community in which it's generated. So big anchor institutions like Queen's and like the hospitals and all of them should be breaking down their um, uh, their contracts into sm much smaller bite-sized pieces so that smaller local firms and businesses can tender for them and then get the job and all that money remains within the local economy. Preston model was highly successful. Preston went from, I think, bottom of the league table to somewhere near the top, having um, used that model. And Belfast City Council have been talking about it for I don't know how many years. And Mary will thank me for doing that now. So that's what I wanted to say. Keep getting the message out there. So. Whose who's dissertation I supervised on Oh, the, is that? Well, there you go, the you topic. see. And actually yeah. just on that, Minister Deirdre Hargy, just before they all left and no longer ministers, she did announce that community wealth building is going to be rolled out now. So there was a commitment mm -hmm. on that. So that's down to the hard work of Mary. So if Mary's listening, well done. Your, your work <laughs> has not gone unheeded. So. Just uh, while you're doing a plug, and <laughs> that was good, good call. Because I was thinking, like, well, what is, you know, you were saying about people engaging in protests and that, and that the language can be divisive. And, you know, like capitalism is the enemy for sure. but. Not everybody's able to hear that or gets that or wants to wants to kind of engage in that. Whereas if you break it, it's not capitalism itself. It's it's global capitalism as we know it. Like there's nothing wrong with enterprise mm -hmm. and community wealth building is that it's mm -hmm. about, you know, it's about generating income, but keeping it where, where it needs to be, you know. Yeah. But just one plug for an ACA women's collective our, and the Culture Club initiative are being booted out of the vault uh -huh. soon. The vault is closing. And so they're kind of in this kind of a crisis situation of needing a kitchen space. They don't need exclusive ownership or use of it. But if anybody in any of your networks knows of a, a potential kitchen space with fridge units for storage, <laughs> give us a shout. That's really random, I know, and, and a bit um, unlikely, but anyway. You guys might know somebody. But, but also connects. I mean, I don't know. Do people know about the vaults, Julian East Belfast? It's kind of another because we often get very down about what's going on. The politicians are all the same sectarian stuff. Is that going to move? And yet we have examples of what you were describing tonight of grassroots initiatives and the vaults. They have a tool library, you know, and which is particularly important in a cost of living crisis of people not feeling compelled to buy expensive power drills, ladders and so on, but unfortunately their, their lease is coming to an end, that they're looking for another, another space. But before I close off, I want to give Leona, do you want to make your announcement? So Leona is one of our early career researchers who's doing a piece of research and she's going to asking you for your help. Yes. Um, oh. I'll wanted to quickly say firstly I found that so interesting it was so great to hear everything that's going on especially um, on my doorstep in West Belfast lots of things that I was unaware of that now I know about which is great um, but I also just wanted to mention a study that's going on with um, Queen's Centre for Public Health so we're conducting um, a 12-week nutrition intervention study to look at um, 
newly developed dietary recommendations which are healthy and have a lower environmental impact and we're looking for volunteers um, so just if you're interested in participating then just come up to me at the end and let me know and I'll give you a flyer just to make you aware about it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. So listen, can I thank everybody for coming out on this not particularly nice evening? Can I thank Louise? Can I thank Pauline? Can I thank Alan who has been recording this? Yeah. And can I thank Teresa for putting it together? So can I give a round of applause, round of applause everybody? <laughs>